Hello, everyone, and welcome to Fraser's Capital Podcast. Today, we have a very exciting guest, Brian Hartzer. Now, Brian was CEO of Westpac, uh, which, for those offshore, is one of Australia's oldest and largest banks and actually institutions. Westpac has a market cap of over 90 billion and millions of customers around the country and indeed the world. Now, Brian has recently published a book called The Leadership Star, which as of today, April 2, is available in bookstores. And having read it, I highly encourage you to too. Brian is very generous with his experience in leadership and banking and gives insight into how one of the top leaders in the country looks at upcoming companies in fintech, the buy now, pay later space, cryptocurrency and neobanks. Without further ado, please enjoy. Hi, Brian. How are you? Good, Michael. Great to see you. Yeah, thanks so much for taking the time. It was actually um, Christina Semenova that uh, suggested we get in contact, and that's associated with your work at the museum. Yeah. Uh, you know, recently appointed chairman. Um, are you able to elaborate, like, what's next for the Australian Museum and kind of what you're sure. And that's going to yeah, be. Yeah. Well, um, so I'm the chairman of the foundation. Um, I'm a trustee of the museum as well. And the foundation exists to try to raise untied money. By, by which I mean it's not tied to the budget that the New South Wales state government gives the museum so that it gives them the flexibility to do new projects and um, other sorts of renovations and ex- exhibitions that they might not be able to do if they rely totally on government funding. But it, it's a really exciting time for the museum. A lot of your listeners have probably been to the museum as kids, but uh, they've just finished a $60 million renovation and the place is spectacular. And uh, the other thing that's quite interesting about it is that what most people don't know is there's over 100 scientists at the museum doing research on earth science, life science, uh, indigenous culture, reconciliation. Um, So if you think about the things that people care about, climate change, the oceans, the reef, Australian wildlife, reconciliation, these are all things that the museum is actually running research projects on. And so it's, I like to say the museum is really about the future, not about the past. And uh, I think it, it creates a, a good timing for people to, to get involved in the museum. And uh, certainly it was attractive to me. Yeah, absolutely. I know there's a few youth programs that I'm kind of involved in as well. Yeah. Um, yeah. We're trying to get a lot more people to come around and have a look. There's some events. I think Thursday night, there's a kind of a, a drinks event. They get music going and you can walk around the museum and it's a great social environment. Um, it's, it's definitely worth checking out if people haven't been there and they're in, in the city CBD. Yeah, definitely. And those kind of archives they have that, you know, if you ask nicely or join one of the kind of groups, the amount of artifacts and, you know, animals and, and, and things that they're really impressive. It's amazing. There's 21 million objects in, in the uh, museum stores. And my personal favorite behind the scenes, if you're really, really nice to them, as you say, um, they can open up a cabinet and show you a Tasmanian tiger, um, right. which, of which they have several. Not many people get to see that, but um, there's some we'll really amazing that. things behind the scenes there. All right. So I understand this has been a pretty big week for you. I mean, you've just launched a book. Um, yeah. Are you happy to talk about that? I mean, it's, it's a leadership book. Um, yeah, you have to kind of give a quick rundown. Sure, sure. Well, it's funny. Um, a, f- a very good friend of mine who was CEO at Travelocity, and uh, and he's now a, a tech investor and and has done incredibly well. He uh, he read the book, and his his comment to me was, um, do, "Does the world really need another leadership book?" I didn't think so until I read this one, uh, right. which which was a re- I thought a really nice endorsement. I had the same thought. I've read zillions of business books. Uh, over time, a lot of leadership books, as, as you probably have as well. And so I didn't want to write anything unless I felt like I had something useful to contribute. And there was this one topic that was something I had spent a lot of time through my career focusing on, which was, what do you do as an individual leader to build engagement? And how do you get people emotionally involved in the company and keep them sustainably over time? And that it's based on this pretty simple idea, which is that if you can get the best people to come and work for you and create an environment where they do well, then you're more likely to be successful over time. And that was something that I found there were a lot of theories around about what companies ought to do around engagement and whether it's on communications or on training or uh, on compensation. There's all these sorts of things people will talk to you about theoretically. But when I would ask the question, okay, but what do I personally need to do nobody could give me a good answer. And so I started paying attention to that as I was learning. Um, I, I don't have an MBA. I'm not, a, I'm not a trained leader. I had to figure it out along the way. 
And so I started paying attention to people who were doing really well at it. And over time, I created this little framework, which was simple enough for me to remember it. So I thought that was another thing with the book is I, I didn't want people to have to remember it because um, or have to go back to the book rather. I, I don't know about you, but often I finish a book and I've forgotten what I've read. Absolutely. And so I boiled it down into these five C's. And because there were five points, I thought, well, there's five points of a star. I'll call that the leadership star. And it was just this idea of creating a visual of, okay, a star, five points, five things, right? Five C's. What are the five C's? And then I can remember that and I can use that to, to frame what I'm doing, to assess how I'm doing. And if things aren't going well, they go, well, am I actually doing these five things? Or, oh yeah, I haven't actually done that for a while. So that's where, that's where it came from. And I've tried to write a book that is what I wish I had had 20 years ago when I was starting out running a business. Is and this when you shifted from uh, being a boutique consultant to kind of your first business role? Yeah, exactly. So I was a management consultant for 10 years. And, uh, and then I was very fortunate and I was given an opportunity to run a business, which was ANZ's credit card business. And so I went from managing about five consultants to managing a thousand people. What was and, that like? What was that? Um, it was pretty daunting. <laughs> uh, it was exciting. I was, I was thrilled that the credit card business was at a really interesting inflection point. The internet was just coming along. We were starting to think about how we could use that for marketing and service. Um, we were getting wow. access to huge amounts of data that was getting us new insights on segmentation and pricing. So it was a lot of fun, but the challenge of managing a thousand people and organizing all that was something I, I hadn't trained for. And um, so I had to figure it out. Absolutely. What were the kind of key striking things that happened? Like, was it just a case of, you know, you're spending half your time managing people instead of doing analysis was that kind of the shift? It seems like it was a pretty pivotal moment for your for your career. Yeah. Well, when you've got a large organization or you're or or as you're progressing through management, people often talk about CEO, but I think that the skills that you develop at different stages in management are probably just as challenging and just as important. This thing about how do you work through other people? Um, I had started out with a pretty simple thought, which was that particularly in Australia, the talent pool is relatively limited in specialized fields. And so I had this simple idea, which is if I can get the best people in credit cards to want to work for me, and if I can create a good environment for them, then we'll win. That was, it was kind of that simple. Yeah. And so that pushed me toward this idea of, okay, well, what sort of environment do I need to create for those kind of people to want to work here? Hmm. And, um, and, and so it, I really became very focused on this dual challenge of identifying and attracting great people and creating an environment where they can do well. Right. And, and, and that has continued to be, I think, one of the key distinctions for me and, and has helped me grow my career over time is continuing to focus on those two things. Right. And you mentioned that um, that was kind of pretty early on in the internet stage. I mean, yeah. credit cards were around, if I'm correct, like long before you know, the internet really took off. Kind of where were you when you joined? Where were credit cards uh, when you kind of joined that business? What stage of development? Well, it's interesting. In Australia, the first loyalty card that we would think of in any significant terms was the Quant, called the Qantas Telstra Visa card. Right. And that was introduced around, I think, 1994. I think it started with the Telstra Visa card and then Qantas joined a couple of years after that. So that whole notion of loyalty points as being embedded in the credit card thing was still relatively new. Overseas, Capital One had started in the 90s in the US and was doing growing pretty rapidly and Capital One was known, they were the first ones to really use data to drive segmentation. But a lot of what they were doing was direct mail. So credit right. cards were still sold predominantly through direct mail or to an extent for banks through their retail branches. There was really nothing going on online and, and we started exploring that. The other thing that was really, um, a big issue at the time was as people were starting to shop online, there was tremendous fear about, is it safe? And yeah, can you I remember that and, when I was a child, right? You Would you use a credit card it. online? Yeah. Oh my gosh. Typing your credit card number in online. That's really scary. And so there was a lot of focus early on about how do we make sure that shopping online is safe and how do we tell people that in a, in a compelling way? I don't know if you remember, but we did an ad that was called the Falcon uh, where we had this kind of goofy 
ad where this bird would fly down and land on the criminals' heads when they tried to impersonate you with a credit card. And, and that just really cut through. That was one of the more fun things I've been involved in in my career was, uh, was that ad campaign. It was all about giving people confidence that, yes, my goodness, what a crazy thought you can shop on the internet. And amazing. Look at us now. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, there's a couple of phrases in your book that kind of like, struck me so one was um i'm just a teller Are you able to say yeah. what you mean by that what's the context around that what- yeah so one of the things i've come to believe so i should just quickly run through the five c's so the oh, five yeah. c's yeah. are care context clarity clearing the way and celebrate and so the uh second c that i like to talk about is context which is really about why why does the organization exist why is what it's doing important in a broader societal sense? And why does what you do all day matter to the delivery of that purpose? And so in my career in retail banking, I would visit lots of branches and I, I developed this thing, which is I'd, I'd walk into a branch and I'd introduce myself around and I would say to people, what do you do? And if someone said, oh, I'm, I'm Sally, I'm just a teller. I knew there was a problem with the manager. Because if people didn't understand that as a teller, you are the face of the bank for most people that come in and they're going to judge the bank based on the way you are and the way that you treat them. And if the teller thinks I'm just a teller, that's a lowly position, then the manager hasn't done a good job of explaining context about actually what you do is unbelievably important. And, and I, I feel that if you want people to be emotionally engaged, they want to get out of bed in the morning feeling like what they're doing is meaningful. And it's about connecting how they can contribute in a way that feels good to them. And, and the great tellers, for example, are people who really like helping people. They like people. They, like, they, love, they love their customers. They love talking to their customers. They love helping their customers. That gives them a sense of individual purpose. And then that individual purpose also contributes to the broader goal of the organization. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's it's also striking that often the most junior people, like it might be somebody straight out of a training program, and they're the people at the cold face, you know, yeah. customer that, 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 you know, really determine what people's experience is like. Yeah, and I suppose the point I'm making with all of the Cs is that it you can't, as a leader, just expect it to happen. It takes deliberate action. It takes being proactive. It You can't assume people know that. Most people come into a company, as you say, you start in a training program, you feel like, gee, I'm at the bottom end of the totem pole. There's all these really important people around. And it's the job of the manager to say, no, 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 no. If you're dealing with customers, you are the most important person. Mm. There's a, there's a story in the book uh, about Disney and I've, I've looked being in the service industry. I've been really intrigued in my career about how Disney, particularly the Disney resorts run themselves. And, when you learn about Disney, one of the things they talk about is that the most important people at Disneyland or Disney World are not the people in the Mickey Mouse costumes. They're actually the street cleaners because the street cleaners are creating an environment that people experience. And the street cleaners are the ones that can see when a child is lost or can see when a family is trying to find a particular ride and doesn't know how to get there or can see that there's a parade going on and can go up to a family and say, hey, if you stand over there, you'll get a get you'll be able to have a a better view for the uh, the short kids in the family. And, and okay. so it's that recognition about the need to explain to people why their job is important, why they should feel good about what they do and how it contributes. In the same way, when I'm talking about care, that's not about just going, oh yeah, I care about my people. That's about how do you demonstrate that? Mm-hmm. And I think that that leadership is really about taking actions that that cause the creation of action or cause the creation of an environment. Right. Uh, there's another phrase, uh, clear the way. I yeah. thought that was interesting in your context, obviously running a, an enormous organization, probably at times quite bureaucratic organization. Are you able to elaborate on that and give examples or you know, how, do you yeah. manage, how do you clear the way? So again, the clearing the way is the recognition that once people are clear on what they need to do, they, they face various barriers. Those barriers may be constraints on resources. They may be a lack of knowledge, a lack of training. They could be emotional barriers. They could be political barriers. And one of the jobs of leadership is to ask people, what is in the way? You Okay, you know what's expected of you. What's in the way of that? And how can I help you by removing those barriers? 
Now, you talked about bureaucracy, and that's a great example. Um, sometimes it is uh, taking the time to um, support your people to overcome some sort of bureaucratic hurdle that they've come across, uh, escalating an issue and, and removing it. Other times it might be your job is to make it really clear who's accountable for what, who has what authority and who doesn't so that people can get on with things. Sometimes it might be that you need to think about the structure of what resources you've given to people versus what you've made them dependent on. Sometimes it might simply be cutting through the bureaucracy could be people have lost sight of what the end result needs to be and how everyone needs to be aligned to deliver something and they get caught up in a process rather than an outcome. And so the job of leadership is to keep bringing people back to, hey guys, this is the outcome we want. How are we going to work together to achieve that? Right. Um, how's leadership culture changed, you know, over time from the beginning of your career uh, to now? Are there any things that really stick out that kind of strike you as being very different about how people, you know, operate and manage? Yeah, well, I learned about business probably in the 80s and the 90s when there was this incredible focus on uh, value creation and what I would say were really about financial rewards. Mm. And there was this sense that you could almost arithmetically drive growth and value by just focusing on the things that drove profitability and by aligning people's incentives with if you grow shareholder value, then you get rewarded. And I think that what has clearly happened over the last 20 years has been the recognition that while much of that is still true, it's not enough. And that actually, if you want to build a sustainable business, you have to think about customers first, and you have to think about how you're helping customers over time. You have to think about the community obligations of a company, you have to think about the organizational health of the company and the health of the health and safety of the people that work there. And so leadership has become, I think, much more multidimensional in that it's not that in the end you aren't still running a business and you need to create value, but it's the recognition that the job of leadership is creating in creating value is, is a much broader one than simply making ruthless financial decisions. Yeah, absolutely. There was a phrase, uh, I don't know if it was one of yours or if it was a quote, but it was like, wars are won by patriots and not mercenaries. <laughs> I think yeah, uh, it's not my that. quote, but I like that a lot. <laughs> I think that um, if, uh, I mean, I recognize that there are, if you take the investment banking world, there are times when there is value to be unlocked through financial engineering. Mm. And so there are companies which exist fundamentally around some sort of financial proposition you can go in and you can make certain changes and people make money and you move on. And, and that's a valid thing for people to do. But for me, I've always been much more enamored with the broader contribution that business can make and into improving people's lives and driving innovation and, and all the rest of it. And, and I think that it's much more personally rewarding for me to be working with people who feel like they're contributing to something. And if it's not that we, don't want to make money or it's that you don't want to be profitable and all those sorts of things. And that's, that's normal as well. But I think to me, if you want people to feel really good about what they do and put their all into it, they need to feel like they're making a contribution to something more important than, than just how much money they make at the end of the year. Yeah, absolutely. I think uh, everyone would agree with that. Um, you also spent a lot of time in the UK at uh, RBC. Were there any noticeable differences between kind of the cultures in the, that in the British organizations in the Australian? Yeah, so RBS, I'm sorry, Royal Bank RBS, of Scotland. Sorry. Um, that's okay. Um, well, RBS was probably the biggest bank failure in history. And I was brought in as part of the cleanup crew after the financial crisis to try to turn that around. So the leadership challenges in there were rather particular in that you had tens of thousands of people who were worried about losing their job. And, and a large number of whom had, over the previous decade, put all of their, reinvested all of their earnings into RBS shares, and so had seen their net worth wiped out. And so I had literally tens of thousands of people working for me who had lost their life savings and were probably going to lose their job. Wow. And so that had its own particular leadership challenges with it. I did find, um, your listeners probably don't know, I mean, listening to me, my obviously my accent's American, but I've been in Australia for 27 years. And 
Um, I found going from Australia to the UK was pretty easy in terms of understanding the culture. I think the culture versus the United States is, is, is much more challenging, much, much different. Um, so I didn't find there were, there are certain cultural quirks, but I didn't find it really that different from Australia. The challenge was more around the state of the economy and the mindset of the people that were working there. And, and how do you rebuild a level of confidence and energy and emotion to people who've just been devastated by what they've just been through? That's tough. I mean, when you look back, what do you think, do you think RBS, what do you think RBS really got wrong to find themselves in that situation? Do you think they just overstretched at the wrong time? Do you think there was a cultural thing that needed to be changed? And looking back now, it's, you know, it's quite a long time ago now, so you can really reflect on it, right? Yeah. Well, my reflection is that RBS was undone by what I call banking 101 errors hmm. more than anything. Um, they, they had this belief that they could always get money. So they, they, they used to say that 50% of the financial transactions in the United Kingdom go through RBS's systems every day. So therefore we can always get liquidity. So they had lots of deposits and they thought, well, we can always get liquidity. Liquidity is endlessly available. Liquidity is free. Number two, they thought that value in banks was all about growth and, and maximizing return on equity. And now mathematically, that is true, as you would know well. But where they took that was, OK, so therefore what we need to do is grow as fast as we can and minimize the amount of equity we hold. So how do we do that? Well, number one, we will give cash-based bonuses to investment bankers to grow their balance sheets as fast as possible. And by the way, we're not worried about that because remember, liquidity is endless. So we can grow as fast and as big as we like. And, the, and whoever grows the fastest will reward them with cash at the end of the year. So they have no skin in the game of the risk that they're taking. Right. Um, and on top of that, we'll play every game in the book to minimize the amount of equity we need to hold against the loans that we write or the financial positions we take. So what that meant was when things were going well, they grew incredibly fast and it all looked fantastic, but it was unbelievably vulnerable. And then on top of that, you had a, a leadership culture where you had a CEO, Fred Goodwin, who became was obsessed with his own reputation and being seen as a kind of genius of business and um, and was um, not particularly interested in in being told where things weren't going well. And so that created a particular culture where people didn't face up to the issues that uh, that they were getting. So it was it was just a classic set of of errors um, that just went phenomenally wrong. And it was uh, it was terribly sad because there were lo and are loads of great people there, and yeah. and they had a terrific customer base. And they've now renamed themselves NetWest, um, gone back to an, one of the old names, and uh, and I think I think we'll we'll still ultimately do quite well. Um, they have a very strong market position, but it was uh, it was a heck of an experience, and I certainly learned more from uh, what goes wrong in a bank than than what goes right. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you must have been there and they're still quite shell shocked from the whole thing. They were very shell shocked. That is a good description. Do you think uh, you mentioned something about U.S. cultures? Do you think that you know maximizing profit, paying cash bonuses, incentivizing growth is that kind of something that's kind of American? Or you know, I want to make this all about different you know cultures. But I'm just curious what you meant by that. Yeah, I do think that it grew out of that Jack Welsh um, uh, 1980s takeover culture, which was itself a response to lots of fat, lazy corporate bloated conglomerates that weren't very efficient. And I think it, it was, it probably just went a bit far is like a lot of things that things tend to overshoot, right? Markets overshoot, yeah. cultures overshoot. Um, and I think that's what happened. There's a, clearly there's a role for financial incentive, but the problem is that every structure has consequences and unintended consequences. And in some cases, uh, the wrong set of incentives can lead to um, good can lead to good people doing the wrong things can lead to an over focus on things that um, that shouldn't be and missing things that are important and so on. Yeah, 
Absolutely. Hey, quick question. Uh, I was in the UK for about eight years and I noticed that banking there was awful, the technology. <laughs> yeah. What was that about? Was that a lack of underinvestment? Like I'd, I'd have a CBA account here oh, and a Westpac one. <laughs> in the UK, I had HSBC and it was, it was awful. It was, um, you know, a dongle. The whole thing just didn't work anywhere near as well as especially all the Australians. Was, was there yeah. a reason behind that? Yeah, there's a couple of reasons. One we've already talked about, which is this focus on shareholder value meant people underinvested in systems that can, because bank technology traditionally has been extremely complex and expensive. And so it's a very long-term proposition in a large bank to change the systems. And so at various times, different banks have held off on making those investments in order to drive short-term results. But the other, and, and the UK is clearly an example of that. Some US banks, same, same story. Some Australian banks, same story. But the bigger issue, and, and I have, a, I think, a slightly surprising perspective on this, which is people get really excited about competition. And mm. most people, the word competition is synonymous with number of competitors, that more competitors must equal more competition. And I would, in the context of banking, I would challenge that slightly in that when you have a slightly smaller number of large competitors, it's easier for them when it comes to things like technology and computer networks and interconnectivity and the like, it's easier for them to agree standards. So if you've been in the US, you probably noticed that mobile phone coverage is terrible. I don't know if you've mm -hmm. sort of experienced that yourself, but you move around and, and it's just nowhere near as reliable as it typically is in Australia. And there's a reason for that. And it's too much competition. Wow. So you, you've got all these different people doing bits of it and not being able to coordinate. And in Australia, we've been very lucky in that the banks have been able from time to time to get together and agree standards on how things ought to work. Hence the creation of things like BPAY, the interconnected ATM networks, uh, chip cards. I mean, I'll give you a real life example from my career. So right. back in the early 2000s, there was this recognition that the magnetic stripe on the back of credit cards wasn't very secure. And we were seeing a lot of what was called skimming, where people would copy the mag stripe and, and copy people's cards. And there was a recognition that chip technology on a card was much more secure. But the problem with that was for chips to work, you needed all the terminals to have chips in it. Uh, had chip capability and you needed all the cards to have the chips. And so there was this chicken and egg problem. Now that meant that in the U S you, I, I think only recently have you now got chip cards out there mm. because the merchant terminals were owned by different competitors than the, than the card issuers and nobody wanted to spend the money in Australia. Uh, and I was actually in the room. We all got in a room one day in about 2002 and said, let's just do this. Right. And, and we all, it was the Visa Executive Committee. Um, so it was representatives of all the banks. And I was the ANZ representative. And we just said, yeah, you know what? This would be good for the country. Let's just do it. And so we just decided on a time frame and said, right, we're all going to do it. And it was literally in one room, we just decided to do it. And as a consequence of that, you got to chip acceptance way faster in Australia than just about anywhere else in the world. That then led to contactless uh, acceptance faster. So, so Australia was one of the fastest countries in the world to have contactless cards, right. which by the way, also then led to the ability to have Apple watches to make payments, phones to make payments, all the rest of it, because we put the infrastructure out to do it. And we did that because it was a small number of competitors who could just decide to do it. So, I just, I, I throw that in because most people will have this basic assumption that more competitors equals better outcomes for consumers. And I would say, actually, you want better competition in order to drive better outcomes for consumers, not to necessarily just have lots of competitors. Absolutely. I mean, you wonder, I mean, for people overseas, Australia is kind of an unusual banking structure you can probably describe better, but it's basically four, obviously, <laughs> there's four major banks and then a few small ones. Um, do you think that affected the way, you know, we sailed through the last financial crisis? Do you think that made it less competitive, less desperation around, you know, reaching for growth and, and profits and unusual, you know, exotic kind of things that undid the offshore banks? I think there are two things there. So 
the biggest thing in my mind as to why we sailed through the crisis relatively unscathed was that Australian banks still hold their mortgages on their balance sheet. Right. Whereas in the US and in the UK, lots of mortgages are securitized. And so the, the banks became in the business of just originating the credit and not worrying so much about what the quality was thereafter. That was particularly true in the US. So in Australia, that meant that we were more conservative because we were going to have to live with the loans that we wrote. Right. So we didn't have the whole subprime thing that, that blew up the US mortgage market. The other part of it though, was that the people running Australian banks in the 2000s still vividly remembered the 91 recession. And remember that most of the Australian banks nearly died in 1991 because of too much commercial real estate lending, too much dodgy acquisition finance and the like. And so the same people largely were sitting around tables in 2008 who right. had been in their careers in 1991-92. And, and we had a very strong ethos within the, at least the banks I worked on of never again. You know, we're, I mean, particularly at Westpac, I think that's still there. Um, Westpac nearly died in 91. We had a really strong never again ethos that meant that we were inherently pretty conservative or tried to be pretty conservative when it came to credit. Didn't mean we didn't and haven't continued to make mistakes from time to time, but we've been pretty conscious about how much concentrated risk we take. And obviously was, since the crisis have become much more conscious of funding risks as well. Right. What was that crisis uh, really about in the early nineties? I mean, I've heard about it, but don't really know too much because I was probably a few years old at the time. Yeah. It was essentially banks lent way too much money to property developers and corporate raiders right. and um, blew up their balance sheets without uh, really understanding the risks that they were taking. And so eventually that went through a cycle of uh, implosion and there were enormous write-offs on property, commercial property loans and uh, corporate loans. And, right. um, and some of the banks nearly fell over. There were also consumer finance, highly risky consumer finance loans. They're just the credit, the credit approval disciplines weren't very good. Hmm. And um, and the balance sheets were just way too stretched. What was the way out? Did we just write down the losses and then move on? Huge, or huge write-off losses, huge cost cutting, uh, increased fees. A lot of the animosity toward Australian banks dates back to that period where the banks uh, had to foreclose on on companies um, had right. to increase fees, had to shut branches, and uh, and probably went too far on that through the '90s as they recovered. And so that's where a lot of that historical animosity to Australian banks comes from. On that note, that uh, what do you think about the future of branches? Um, how do you think that's going to evolve with the internet and you know all these banks online? Yeah, well, the way I've always felt about it is that money is emotional. And, and it's emotional because people are afraid to lose money or it's tied up in their own sense of self-worth and so on. And while there's probably 10 or 20 percent of the population uh, who work in the financial industry or are fundamentally really comfortable around numbers and dealing with money, most people in the population are intimidated by money. And the way that human beings deal with things that they're afraid of is they try to find another human being that they can trust to tell them what to do. Right. And so the way I've always thought about branches is it's not that there's something magical about four walls and bricks and teller counters. It's that there's people there. Mm -hmm. And so I think the fundamental desire of human beings to have human contact when it comes to important financial decisions, I don't think that's going to go away. But a lot of the activity that goes on in, in branches today, which relates to processing cash and checks and payments and the like, that's obviously all going digital. So I think what you ultimately have is some combination of a uh, physical place where you can go to talk to people when you need it, but probably a lot of that can be delivered by video now as well. Mm. I think that's still going to be important. And I think cash is with us for a fair while yet, um, regardless of the growth of digital payments. So I think there will still be branches, but I, I certainly think there'll be a lot fewer of them. 
And I think we'll see hybrids evolve where people still have access to a human being when they need important decisions. Um, I'll, I'll tell you a funny story that you'll relate to this. So robo advice is one of those things that people think is, is a no brainer that at some point you'll be able to use online tools to tell you how you should invest your money. Um, I was talking to a company in San Francisco who is a pretty successful robo advice company over there. And yeah. they were telling me, I, I'd gotten to know these guys and they were telling me how when a lot of their early customers were Silicon Valley tech employees and they got very excited because they knew who they were and they knew where they worked. Their companies were floating or having an exit. So they thought, fantastic. We're going to start getting a lot more money from these guys as they get their payouts. And the money didn't come. And so they started ringing them up and saying, why haven't you put more money into your account? And they said, are you yeah. kidding? $800,000 is a lot of money. I want to talk to someone. I'm not just sticking it in that machine. So I think that I think there will continue to be a need for human interaction, whether you call that advice or, or, or whatever. Um, you look at the prevalence of mortgage brokers today. You, you still have lots of human mortgage brokers out there when it's not very hard to go online and see yep. what your options are. I think that That's reflects this human need for reassurance. Yeah, just taking you through your options. You can really see the value that something like that adds in investments or, or something yeah. else. That um, question on kind of internal competition, obviously Westpac had a number of different brands. Um, some are function of acquisition, some are probably more deliberate. Um, how did that work? How do you think about that? How were you thinking about that? So the way I thought about it was that simplistically, the research shows that in Australia anyway, there are people who see themselves as big bank people and there are people who see themselves as small bank people. Right. And there's, I'm, I'm going to oversimplify this, but I've seen the research again and again, and it validates this. So big bank people tend to be people who like the idea of having lots of options, are somewhat more confident in their abilities with money, and want the sense of confidence, and I've arrived, and, um, and I deserve to be with a major name player, and they want the, they want the security of the big brand name, and so on. Smaller bank people tend to be people who are intimidated by money. Um, for example, we, um, with, your, with your dad, we used to have these um, St. George business banking functions, right? And when you'd go to them, what you inevitably saw was the room was full of entrepreneurs and first-generation Australian business people for whom the big bank brands are intimidating. Right. And the smaller brand was smaller, friendlier, felt safer, less intimidating. So my view was, let's not fight that. Um, let's create an experience for people who want that small bank feel. And let's create um, the experience for the people that want the strength of the big strength and options of the big institution. Um, behind the scenes, though, what we were trying to do was really have a common platform, because the technology underneath that didn't need to be different. But the the layer of of experience could be different in terms of the options you gave to people, the sort of people you hired, the way that you, the way that you manage relationships and so on. Right. It's so all the technology at the bottom by the end of it was, was, was the same. That was, that was where we were heading. And that, that's that what I thought it to get. You use things like Temenos and those kind of outsource providers, or I guess at Westpac, you just build it all yourselves. And well, we would use, so the history of technology and banking is traditionally you would buy one very large system and then that would do lots of things. And then you might customize that over time to your needs. Mm. The way technologies evolve now, it's moving much more toward a more flexible architecture where you can plug and play different components and banks are trying to move away from customizing all their software. And I think that's, that's the way to go because that will help bring costs down. And you talked about Terminos, there's 10 X is one that, that, um, Westpac has invested in, it's another new platform. And it may be over time that you see banks start to use some of those new systems. At the moment, those systems generally can't cope with the complexity of the customer base and the product set that the large banks offer. So it's right. not easy to convert to that. But over time, as they simplify their products, I think you'll see some of those new technologies get used more often. Got it. And so the topic of our technology, wouldn't mind getting your views on, you know, fintech and some of the things going on there. Yeah. What are your thoughts on buy now, pay later? I mean, that's been around for five, six years now, started in Australia. 
is now changing the way you know people shop globally. Um, what do you think of that rise? And you know, what do you think about that now looking back as well? So I have a, a sort of old guy view on that one, which is that to me, buy now, pay later is just a re-engineering of the Harvey Norman credit card. So once upon a time, you'd go into Harvey Norman to buy your fax machine, if you remember what that was, and you would stand there and you'd fill out a form and you'd wait a while and then someone would come back and say, good, you've been approved and you can pay this off in a certain number of payments with no interest. And that met a need for uh, finance, but unsecured finance, but it was a very clunky process. And I think the, the great innovation of these guys has been to say, wait a minute, in the digital world, we can make that kind of experience much more streamlined and, and easy. And we can offer that same capability across multiple merchants because of online shopping in particular. But increasingly, we can embed that into the terminals at a, at a physical point of sale. So I view that as a, a very sensible innovation in the sense that it's a re-engineering of a known need. Right. Now, how far that will extend the, are the brands that they're building or the customer bases that they're building able to extend more broadly into other aspects of financial services? Time will tell. I suspect to an extent, but I, I'm not sure you're going to see a wholesale shift of people, all of people's banking to these new brands. Some probably will. They'll inevitably they'll build a a very loyal customer base that will will want to do other things with them. But I think that as people's when you go beyond financing your new bike to wanting to buy a house, my experience is people start to think differently about the role of brands. So I, I think brands can typically extend a bit, but I'm not I'm not convinced that those brands are going to completely replace the existing players who have a lot of existing customers, a lot of existing data, a lot of existing capability, and are themselves improving their own online experiences. Right. Um, but I mean, I think the terrific innovations, and I think those guys have done 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 a really good job. Um, I suspect the regulators are going to clip their wings a little bit over time, um, but but I think it's been a great innovation. And as you say, the fact that it's going international now, I think is a terrific thing for Australia. Mm. What do you think about the um, the decline of credit cards? I mean, that seems to be associated with the rise of buy now, pay later. It could be something different. I'm not sure. Um, do you have any views on that? Especially seeing as you, one of your early things was running credit cards. Well, a credit card is two different things. It's a payment mechanism and it's a line of credit. Mm. And the, regulations around that have meant that the nexus between the payment mechanism and the line of credit has been broken a bit in the last few years. So I can see that using a relatively high interest rate revolving line of credit to pay for things will probably be cannibalized to a fair extent by the buy now pay later type offering. And we've seen some banks starting to offer that same capability. I think of it as it's an installment payment facility. And so how do you deliver that? But the credit card itself and the the Visa and MasterCard schemes still have a tremendous advantage in terms of convenience for payments globally. You know, you can go anywhere in the world and know that your Visa card or your MasterCard is going to be accepted uh, they have an incredible installed base of, of effect, effectively ubiquitous acceptance so that you can use that anywhere. So I think that um, they will continue to be chipped away at by new forms of payment. Uh, we've seen in the U.S. people paying through messaging apps and the like. You know, I think we'll probably see that here. So I, I do think that particularly lower value payments will get chipped away at. Um, but on the other hand, what the payment schemes often talk about is that really they're fighting cash and right. there's still a tremendous amount of cash and check payments going on in the world that can benefit from a shift to the, to the card schemes. Um, so, you know, I think the fact that the, for many people, the plastic card has migrated to their phone. Um, you know, does that mean that the credit card business doesn't exist? I mean, you're still using essentially a visa 
scheme to process your payment using your phone. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, I think, I think thinking of it in binary terms of this is going to kill that is, is probably not the best way to think about it. Right. That makes sense. I'd not say uh, the rise of Bitcoin and cryptocurrency, certainly in terms of value over the last kind of seven, eight, nine years. Yeah. Any thoughts of that? Was that, that ever discussed at, you know, board level or in management meetings? Oh, yeah. Well, we, um, when I was at Westpac, we made an investment in Coinbase um, and have a shareholding in Coinbase, which has done remarkably well. That's um, yeah. It's, it will amuse you to know that's one of the few decisions I made where I overruled my risk head. Ah, well done. Yeah. <laughs> so that was you. So, so that one's worked out pretty well. Um, For a bank, is that the best way to kind of deal with these new things? Is just to try and invest in a few of them? Well, that was that was part of our thinking was that there. I've been convinced for at least a decade that we were about to go through the biggest change in the industry that we'd seen in fifty years. Pick a number, right. um, and and it was silly to think that we knew how it was all going to play out. So part of setting up reinventure, which was our venture capital arm, was to allow us to have a seat at the table in some of these things to understand what was happening and, and try to think about the implications of it. And Coinbase was an example of that. Yeah. Um, so Bitcoin, uh, I, I guess I see a couple of issues with Bitcoin as um, and I know people are incredibly excited about it and I'm probably a dinosaur and maybe one day I'll regret saying this, but um, I'm, I still think that the power of the global regulators to control the flow of money and, and to support the value of currencies is, is going to remain really important. Um, the U S dollar people say, well, gee, the U S dollar is, is really a fiction. It's not backed by gold, et cetera, et cetera. That's true, but it is backed by the U S government and the U S government's ability to tax its people. Um, what's Bitcoin backed by, mm, you know, nothing. Um, so it's, it's an amazing innovation, but it doesn't, there's not an inherent, it's only backed by the fact that other people want to back it and you don't know who these people are. And, and I, I'm not trying to complete, I'm certainly not trying to dismiss it. I'm just saying that there is an inherent thing called the U S government that sits behind the U S dollar or the, or the Australian government, the reserve bank of Australia that sits behind the Australian dollar. And, and those have genuine real world power. Absolutely. Um, the second thing that I think I, I read something recently, and by the way, I find Bitcoin fascinating and, and cryptocurrency fascinating. So I, it's, it's clearly a, an important development. But um, the original promise of Bitcoin was going to be support for cashless instant transactions. And yet it's turned out to be a speculative asset, which mm. if you've got something worth $60,000 or $70,000 or whatever it's worth at the moment, why would you use that to buy a pizza? Yeah. <laughs> right. And, and so uh, it inherent in a weird sort of way, it's become a victim of its own success in that the more it's become a speculative asset, the less it becomes compelling as a transactional vehicle. And I think it's, it's pretty obvious that a very large proportion of what it's being used for is, is criminal activity mm. as well as speculation. And, and so, you know, for yeah. me, it's hard to see, mainstream banks wanting to be part of something, particularly when you think about regulators um, focus on any money laundering laws and, and the rest, it, it's a really difficult proposition. Now, the other thing people always say at this point is, however, the blockchain and blockchain innovation is brilliant and a really important development in how data gets stored and shared. And I think Things like blockchain-based mortgage settlements or uh, using blockchain for guarantees and, and other sorts of things that banks do, I think there's, there's clearly tremendous scope for re-engineering processes using that. Yeah, I think I'd agree with all of that. I think there's one, um, there's definitely use cases for this stuff. That, like imagine if you lived in, and to go to your first point about governments, imagine if you lived in large parts of Asia, South America, Africa, you can be a very wealthy person there. The political winds can change. And you can lose everything. Yeah, you're you know? right. And you might be cut off. In the US you're system. right. And I, I would say that is the one and only legitimate 
uh, use case that I've also heard that I've accepted. Um, I and when I talked yeah. to the Coinbase guys, they talked to me about what if you're in Bolivia? Really? And, uh, you know, that was actually the use case. And I went, yeah, okay, I get yeah. that. And I accept that. If you want to buy a refrigerator and you live in Bolivia, then having Bitcoin is probably not a bad idea. Um, yeah. But, you know, and what's the other one again? Yeah. Uh, well, I guess. <laughs> so, you know, that's you know, Joe's run. The other one, the other one is criminal activities. If you think about, yeah, exactly. this is, you don't have to participate in it. If you think about what's driving the price, like criminal activity is obviously large around the world and unstable governments and citizenry is large around the world. So the fact that these are two enormous use cases could be one of the many things in addition to speculation, you know, have driven this. Well, I, I'm not taking a view on whether or not price. one should buy Bitcoin or not. Um, I'm just saying that the, bank the, would. the original proposition that this is going to upturn the global financial system and banks are all going to go out of business and it's all going to be Bitcoin wallets. Uh, I'm skeptical. Yeah. No, I think I'd uh, completely agree with you on that one. Um, what about new banks and alternative lenders? Is there space for new models or do you think it's they're just doing what the other banks do, but not quite as well and not quite as well capitalized? No, I do. So I have, those are two different questions in my mind. So, um, I've been of the view that what was going to happen with the neobanks in the Australian context is pretty much what has happened, right. um, which is that simply put, and, and I need to say several things about this because I don't want to sound too negative, but in my mind, the math for a startup neobank just didn't work. Um, when you think about where interest rates are, the cost of meeting regulatory and technology requirements um, to build a deposit-focused transactional business. Um, the only way those things really work is if they lend money in significant volume to cover all those costs. And so I was of the view that probably they would end up either becoming mortgage businesses, like which is what ING Direct is, right. uh, or they would end up being bought by an existing player who had a large asset base and wanted to use that as a fast path to a better online experience, as we've seen with 86400 and NAB. So I'm not surprised by how it's played out. Um, but to the second point, I do think that there is scope for startup fintech businesses in providing financial services to customers in probably in two respects. So one is, and, and all of this in my mind boils down to good old fashioned strategy thinking, where, where there's excess margin being created. Um, so for example, some of the mo models around um, foreign currency payments have done pretty well. And the reason that they're able to do well is because for reasons I won't bore you with, there still remain pretty significant margins and cross subsidies in the foreign exchange markets. And so new players have been able to come in and go, hey, I can go after a, a part of that market where there's cross subsidy going on or there's an excess margin being charged and I can build a better mousetrap and I can do well. And so we've seen examples of that and that makes sense to me. The other is where due to regulatory barriers predominantly, the banks are either being forced to or are choosing not to play in areas that have good risk adjusted returns. So nice. you've seen, and, his, and, and again, Technology is an enabler of this, but it's not exactly a new phenomenon. So if you think about Liberty Financial, who plays in near prime mortgage lending, Liberty has said, the banks don't want to go to the riskier end of the spectrum. We can use data to target people who are actually good risk adjusted returns. We can charge a bit more, but we can still run a good business. They've done phenomenally well. And in the same way, because of responsible lending laws and other sorts of regulations that the banks have been hit with, banks are stepping away from market segments and certain product areas where I think there's still good returns to be earned. And I think we'll see the emergence of some businesses around that. Interesting. That makes a lot of sense. Um, do you have any predictions about the future of banking technology? Any ideas there? Um, yeah. So, well, one we've sort of touched on, which is that the costs are coming down dramatically, mm. um, particularly for the provision of relatively straightforward product capabilities with the use of cloud computing, 
uh, in particular, the ability to do SaaS type offerings. I think that's bringing costs down dramatically. And I think they, the use of data and artificial intelligence to provide really interesting services and better targeting is also um, pretty exciting. Uh, I'm working with a startup in the HR space at the moment um, that is, is just doing some amazing things that are enabled by, by technology that you couldn't have thought to do before. Um, I think, um, what else would I say? The other one, which, which is interesting is, and this is where actually the banks probably have an advantage, is that the more that you have data about a customer and their behavior, the more that you can begin to automate and customize the way you serve them. And so I think we're going to see the emergence of some really clever tools to help make people's lives a lot easier in the way that they manage money. Right. I mentioned you're working for a HR startup. Is that kind of something you're going to be doing more of going forward? Well, one of the great things about the, yeah, one of the great things about the situation that I found myself in is that I've got the time to focus on things that I find genuinely interesting. And as hopefully has come through in this conversation, I've been really interested in developments of technology and what that has meant for the financial industry and, and other industries. And so I'm spending a fair amount of my time as an angel investor and mentor to a number of startups that I've come across. Um, and I'm really enjoying that. And um, yeah, so there's one in HR, there's one actually in fashion, there's right. one called Miss Tyler, which helps women find clothes that fit them better, um, which is a really clever um, proposition. And, uh, and then I'm working with one called basic, which is in open banking data and making, um, that data accessible to people who want to be able to see someone's full picture. So what's that exactly? That's banks sharing information? Or that- so the regulations now require banks to provide access to the full transactional data and right. information that they have about customers. Um, that's rolling out in various stages. And if a customer gives you gives a new provider permission, then they'll be able to pull in that customers' data with all its different providers. And so BASIC is building all the interfaces to the different providers right. and the permissioning engine so that if you decide that you're interested in some new player's proposition, it could be an existing bank, could be a new player, you give permission and then through the BASIC platform, they can go and suck all your information in from all the different players and present that in an integrated way to the new player who can then use it for credit decisioning or um, or other value-added services. Interesting. Mm. Um, that's pretty fascinating. I really enjoyed all that uh, historical anecdote as well. Uh, maybe to wrap things up, if people are going to take one message from your book, um, which I understand is out now in, in shops, is it out yeah, today? It's, in fact, it's, today is the 2nd of April. It's launch day today, so it's in shops Excellent. today, and you can order it from Booktopia or Amazon or wherever else. Right. If people would take one message from that book, what do you think it would be? that it's important that leadership is something anybody can do, but it's important to have a a structured framework for thinking about what it is you need to do and to be very proactive in in taking steps toward that. And there's, there's no one simple formula for every situation, but there are some frameworks you can go back to that if you apply them have been shown to help you build teams that are engaged and perform really well. And um, I guess the other general thing I'd say is I've done this because I think leadership's a really valuable and meaningful thing to do. And I think it's something people should aspire to. Um, It's deeply rewarding at a personal level when you help teams be successful. Um, And and it is something that everybody can do. And uh, read my book and, and you'll find out how. Great. Well, thanks so much, Brian. Really appreciate it. I think everyone find that really interesting. Thanks, Mike. Great to talk to you. I hope you enjoyed that fascinating interview with Brian Hartzer. If you did find it interesting, I'm sure you'll find his book equally so. It's called The Leadership Star and is out now. If you'd like to know more about us and what we do, our website is www.frazerscapitalpartners.com and you can subscribe to this podcast on all major platforms. Hope you have a fabulous weekend.